After George Herbert Walker Bush nominated Clarence Thomas to sit on the Supreme Court, he nominated Clarence Thomas to replace Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, the first black man ever to sit on the Supreme Court, and one of the great champions of civil rights. Uh, I think it's safe to say that Thurgood Marshall is up there with Rosa Parks and Dr. King. Uh, after Clarence Thomas was nominated, Professor Anita Hill stepped forward and said that while she was working for Clarence Thomas, she was sexually harassed by the Supreme Court nominee, repeatedly sexually harassed, and Clarence Thomas created a hostile work environment after she turned down his sexual advances. Now, every man in America knew she was telling the truth. But if Anita Hill could bring down a Supreme Court nominee, that could mean every man in America would be held accountable for their bad behavior. We all knew Anita Hill was telling the truth, not just about Clarence Thomas, but about most of the men sitting on that Senate Judiciary Committee. So there was a conspiracy of silence. More women came forward to accuse Thomas, but the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee back then, Joe Biden, said, we don't have time. Thomas called this a high-tech lynching, and he stonewalled. But most importantly, he lied, and he lied, and he lied, and we all knew he was lying, but he was lying for all the male baby boomers. So he just lied his way onto the Supreme Court, the same way decades later, Brett Kavanaugh lied his way onto the Supreme Court. And we all knew Kavanaugh was lying, but he lied and he lied and he lied because he learned, and the Republicans learned, from Thomas, Clarence Thomas, just keep lying and lying and lying, stonewall and lie. Even though the FBI had more women who wanted to testify against Brett Kavanaugh, the committee circled the wagons and refused to let those women testify the same way those other women weren't allowed to back up Anita Hill and say Clarence Thomas is a sexual harasser and a liar. So Clarence Thomas taught a generation of Republicans that if you lie and refuse to back down, if you say whatever it takes, call it a high-tech lynching, even though you're opposed to affirmative action, say and do whatever, just lie. It's how we ended up with Donald Trump. Just lie. Never back down. Never admit you're wrong. Roger Stone worked for Nixon. And the lesson he ended up teaching Donald Trump is that Nixon's biggest mistake was not burning the White House tapes on the front lawn. Just lie and stonewall and cover up. And that is what the Republican Party has become. Liars. Lying is second nature to them. Now, later, I'm going to be talking about the lawyer, John Eastman, who worked as Clarence Thomas's law clerk. John Eastman is one of Trump's lawyers, indicted down in Georgia for racketeering and organizing the false elector slate and spreading lies about election fraud. And no matter how much evidence is presented to John Eastman proving there was absolutely no election fraud, he remembers what he learned from his mentor, Clarence Thomas. Just keep lying. Lie. Lie. Thomas did some more financial disclosures on Wednesday, and I'll get to those lies in a second. But first, this is the mop-up for September 1st. 2023. I'm David Feldman, and we begin with reports out of the Fulton County, Georgia jail, where just a week ago, Donald Trump was fingerprinted. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reports this morning that one detainee has been stabbed to death and two are injured. 
That is all we know currently. The spokesman for the jail says the situation is still active. During the past few weeks, five Fulton County jail inmates have died. This now makes the ninth inmate to die in that jail so far this year. Fulton County Jail was built nearly 34 years ago and was overcrowded from the start. Fulton County Sheriff Pat Labatt has repeatedly asked the county commissioners to spend close to $2 billion on a brand new jail. $2 billion on a brand new jail. Or you could just stop locking up so many people. How about that? According to the ACLU, nearly half of the 3,642 inmates inside the Fulton County Jail have yet to be charged or indicted. The Sixth Amendment guarantees all Americans the right to a speedy trial. And yet, according to the ACLU, nearly half the 3,642 inmates inside the Fulton County Jail have yet to be charged or indicted. Sidney Powell and Kenneth Cheesebro are asking for a speedy trial, and they've been granted one. I know Kenneth Cheesebro is getting his trial in October, something like October 23rd, and yet half the people in the Fulton County Jail have yet to be charged or indicted. The United Auto Workers' current contract with Detroit expires on September 4th. As negotiations continue, the UAW on Thursday filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board, accusing General Motors and Stellantis of negotiating in bad faith. UAW President Sean Fain says the two automakers are slowing down the process and refusing to get back to him in a timely manner. The UAW did not file a grievance with Ford Motors, saying, unlike the other two car companies, Ford is trying to negotiate in good faith. Six days ago, UAW workers voted overwhelmingly to authorize a strike should Detroit fail to deliver a workable contract in two weeks. It would be the first auto worker strike since 2019. Parts of America are unsafe for LGBTQ plus tourists, so says the Canadian government. The Canadian government warned on Wednesday that several American states have passed legislation targeting the LGBTQ plus community, and Canada has warned Canadians to make informed decisions on where they plan to visit if they're going to America. Earlier this summer, both the NAACP and America's largest lobbying group for the LGBTQ plus community issued traveler advisories for Florida, warning recent legislation there has created an unsafe setting for blacks and gay tourists. Last month, the State Department issued a do not travel warning for Haiti, saying... Haiti wasn't safe after an American and her daughter were kidnapped there, with the United Nations now sending in a peacekeeping force to restore order. But that isn't stopping our good friends from ICE. It's not stopping ICE from flying Haitian migrants out of this country and back to Haiti, even during the height of hurricane season. ICE has doubled the number of what they call air removal flights, sending migrants back to their home country. 850 individual flights took off in August. That's double the number in July. The Biden administration's air removal policy is now at a two-year high, sending migrants back to countries like Haiti. Many of these migrants who are being shipped out of this country have lived here for decades and are often the parents of naturalized citizens born here and left behind. Don McLaughlin, the mayor of Uvalde, Texas, has filed a lawsuit with a local district attorney to speed up the investigation into last year's school shooting that killed 19 babies and two teachers. The mayor 
also called on District Attorney Christina Mitchell to resign, suggesting she is slow walking the inv investigation uh, to cover up for the poor response from Texas's local and state police during that shooting. If you remember, during the May 2022 shooting, a total of 376 local, county, and state law enforcement officers from Texas stood around for 77 minutes doing nothing while students and teachers inside that school called 911 begging for help. After 77 minutes, police finally went in to kill the shooter. Now, in case the district attorney in Uvalde wants to know why it took 77 minutes, let me save you some time. They were afraid of getting shot to death. That's why. Uh, as are all police officers, no matter how much military-grade hardware you shower them with, they're afraid of shooters. Cops are terrified. That's why they keep shooting so many unarmed citizens. Get rid of these guns. A judge has ruled that the state of Texas cannot forbid local cities like Dallas and Austin from passing laws that demand construction workers be given mandatory water breaks. Back in June, after being lobbied by the building industry, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed into law a bill that supersedes local ordinances that he said placed undue hardship on the construction industry. The new law overruled cities that demanded people who work outdoors be given 10-minute breaks to sit in the shade and drink water every couple of hours. Yes, water breaks in triple-digit heat is considered an undue hardship for the people in the construction business, not the people who do the uh, actual construction. It's an undue hardship for the people who hire the people to do the construction. The ACLU, the AFL-CIO, and other pro-labor organizations sued the governor, and the governor now says he plans to appeal the court ruling, which he said isn't worth the paper it was printed on. Jamie Raskin, the Democratic congressman and ranking member of the House Oversight Committee, is asking the committee to launch an investigation into Jared Kushner's $2 billion investment deal with Saudi Arabia, a deal that appears to have been negotiated while Kushner was still working in the White House. Congressman Raskin, in his letter to the committee chairman, points out that Kushner's chief responsibility in the Trump White House was running America's Middle East policy, traveling to Saudi Arabia, as well as other countries in the region, who all ended up investing miraculously in his $2 billion fund that was set up immediately after Trump left office. Meanwhile, a retired teacher has been sentenced to death in Saudi Arabia for going on Twitter and criticizing the Saudi government. The Republican Party is broke. According to the Daily Beast, the Republican Party only has a little more than $11 million in its checking account. The Democratic Party has double that. And considering Joe Biden is the putative nominee, the Democrats don't need any money until a year from now when the general election begins. But the Republican Party needs money to run those primaries and the debates. According to data from the Federal Election Commission, the Republican Party raised $50 million this year, but most of it has been spent on legal fees. Legal fees? Hmm. I wonder whose legal fees? Hmm. Who in the Republican Party needs lawyers these days? Hmm. Why, are, why is the Republican Party uh, paying Donald Trump's legal fees? Now, when Donald Trump announced he was running for the nomination, he was warned before he announced that if you declare, then the Republican National Committee will stop paying any legal fees. Uh, that's customary. Uh, if there are any legal fees incurred from lawsuits filed against Trump 
while he was president, it is the responsibility for the Republican Party to pay those legal fees. But if you declare, then you're on your own. He was told that, and he declared nonetheless. So why is the RNC still spending so much on legal fees? Whose legal fees is the Republican Party paying? Trump's Save America PAC has raised hundreds of millions of dollars since Trump left office. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars since Trump left office. But USA Today reported on Thursday that uh, that the Save America PAC is almost broke. Where did all that money go? Where did all that money go? Is Trump spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on legal fees? And why are his legal fees so expensive? Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on lawyers? That must be one hell of a lawyer. Did, did someone convince him they could reanimate the corpse of Clarence Darrow, but it's going to cost you? Trump currently has four criminal trials going, not to mention all the civil lawsuits, like the one filed by the New York State Attorney General, and he has a brand new defamation lawsuit filed by E. Jean Carroll. And according to USA Today, all these lawsuits can cost tens of millions of dollars, but not hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, to be fair, Trump is paying the legal fees through the Save America PAC. He is paying the legal fees for low-level employees at Mar-a-Lago uh, in that classified documents trial, just so long as they don't testify against him. Have I mentioned Stanley Woodward? But hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars were raised. How is it possible Trump's Save America PAC is down to $3.7 million after hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars? Now, this is significant because elections, especially presidential elections, are about money. You need money to run for president not just to stay out of jail or pay off the Russian mobsters you stole from. The Iowa caucuses are fewer than five months away, and Trump needs money to get that nomination. He must pay for a ground game, television ads. And without money, Trump is going to have to rely solely on free publicity. But this free publicity... The, one, the type of publicity he's getting these days is the polar opposite of the free publicity he got back in 2016. These days, the only person who has something nice to say about Trump is Trump. There's no question right now that Trump is leading in the polls. But you have to win the Republican nomination state by state. He did lose Iowa in 2016, Ted Cruz beat him in Iowa, and Donald Trump screamed election fraud. So he's got to find some money, and things are about to get a lot worse for him, a lot worse. Donald Trump, in a two-page filing with the Fulton County Court on Thursday, pleaded not guilty to racketeering. His arraignment had been scheduled for next Wednesday, but he waived his rights to be told what he was being charged with, so that means he doesn't have to appear in Fulton County, Georgia, next week. That will give him more time to prepare for that big $100,000... Give him more time to prepare for that big $100,000 a plate fundraiser. He's hosting at his Bedminster, New Jersey country club to raise money for Rudy Giuliani's legal fees. That big fundraiser is next week, and it's going to be packed. $100,000 a plate. And you know what they're serving? Nothing, because nobody's showing up. On Thursday, Trump's lawyers in Georgia also filed a motion to sever his case from the 18 other co-defendants so that he can be tried separately. Defendants like Kenneth Cheesebro and I believe Sidney Powell, uh, they've been granted, uh, they've been, they've invoked their right, granted by the state of Georgia, to be given a speedy trial. 
And those trials have been scheduled to begin in mid-October and the 23rd. Kenneth Cheesebro's trial is scheduled for October 23rd, 24th. Not sure about Sidney Powell's. District Attorney Fawny Willis responded to those early trial grants by informing the judge that she's ready to begin. She's ready to begin trying all 19 as soon as possible. She wants to try all 19 at the same time. But Trump's lawyers, in filing the motion to sever his trial from the 18 other defendants, his lawyer said they simply don't have the time to mount a defense in six weeks. They want the trial to start in two years, three years, 2026. The Fulton County DA, Phony Willis, told the judge that she is insistent on trying all 19 defendants at the same time. It's going to be a busy September and October. Joseph Biggs, one of the leaders of the Proud Boys, was sentenced to 17 years in prison after he was found guilty of seditious conspiracy for the role he played in the Capitol's attack on January 6. Biggs served in Iraq, suffered a head injury. He came back to America and became a correspondent for Alex Jones's InfoWars. Like I just said, head injury. The judge said Biggs played a crucial role in the storming of the Capitol when he tore down a fence separating Capitol Police from the mob. In handing down the sentence, U.S. District Judge Timothy Kelly said on Thursday, quote, What happened on January 6th harmed an important American custom that helps support the rule of law and the Constitution. Judge Kelly went on, Quote, that day broke our tradition of peacefully transferring power, which is among the most precious things that we had as Americans. Notice I said had. We don't have it anymore. Unquote. Notice I said had. We don't have it anymore. That's uh, U.S. District Judge Timothy Kelly. Besides Donald Trump and 18 co-defendants being indicted by the Georgia grand jury, also named in that indictment were 30 unindicted co-conspirators. And we're not quite sure who they are yet, but we might gain a keener understanding next week. If you remember, there were two grand juries in Georgia looking into Trump's racketeering. First, uh, they had a grand jury convene That's called a special purpose grand jury. That was last year. And that grand jury, a special uh, purpose grand jury, doesn't indict. A special purpose grand jury assists the district attorney in determining whether she has a case as she brings witnesses before this jury and forces those witnesses to testify under oath. You're not allowed to perjure yourself. The special purpose grand jury then issues a report and makes recommendations as to who they think should be indicted, but it's not legally binding. We learned earlier, back in February, that the special purpose grand jury, that would be the first grand jury that can't indict, we learned earlier, uh, back in February, that the special purpose grand jury felt a good number of witnesses had lied under oath and should be charged with perjury. Fawny Willis, the Fulton County District Attorney, used that grand jury's recommendations to convene a more traditional grand jury to secure her indictments. So far, the first grand jury's report, that would be the special purpose grand jury's report, has remained mostly sealed. But on Thursday, Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney who unsealed portions of that report back in February, announced he would release the report in its entirety on September 8th. This report could shed more light on who the 30 unindicted co-conspirators might be. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the chairwoman of the Republican National Party listed as an unindicted co-conspirator for the role she played in helping to arrange 
the phony slate of electors. And wishful thinking, Lindsey Graham is listed as an unindicted co-conspirator. That's my wish. I'm hoping he's uh, listed as an unindicted co-conspirator for showing up drunk and perjuring himself before the grand jury. Well, big news on Thursday. The new judge in the Georgia racketeering case announced Trump's trial will be televised. Scott McAfee, the presiding judge in this trial, said all proceedings will be live streamed on the court's YouTube channel. I wonder if they'll have a chat room. Federal trials are not televised. Neither are trials in the state of New York. And you can't watch any trials, any hearings before the Supreme Court. You can hear the hearings, but you can't see the hearings. I guess that's why they're called hearings. If you could televise Supreme Court hearings, they would be called seeings. I should take Labor Day off, right? I should take, I should grab a three-day weekend, right? Okay. Supreme Court seeings. Oh, my. (sighs) Clarence Thomas, the man who launched a million lies, seems more open to transparency of late. On Thursday, Thomas made public his amended 2022 financial disclosure form, which had previously been filled with lies. In his latest amended version, Clarence Thomas revealed more first-class travel that had been paid for by Harlan Crow, the billionaire collector of Hitler memorabilia. That's who Clarence Thomas's good friend is, Harlan Crow. One of the world's largest collect has one of the world's largest collections of Hitler memorabilia. Well, in his financial disclosures, Thomas said he accepted a free pli- private flight on Harlan Crow's jet after the Supreme Court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade because Thomas says he felt regular commercial air travel now posed a security risk because of that decision. I see. So last year, the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. And the first thing Clarence Thomas thinks is, my life is in danger. Not all the women who now have to carry an unwanted fetus to term. It's my life that's in danger. Is that the kind of logic they teach at Yale Law School, Clarence? Yeah, we overturn Roe v. Wade, so for safety's sake, I need to fly on a private jet. Jenny, uh, Jenny, the court is about to overturn the Miranda decision. It's not safe. Call billionaire Harlan Crow and tell him to book us a table at Shea Panisse. Because it's not safe, I tell you. It's not safe. Wow. What a reprehensible couple. Jenny Thomas. Oh, that's another unindicted co-conspirator. Hoping maybe it's Ginny Thomas. Well, John Eastman, who's best friends with Ginny Thomas, John Eastman once worked as Clarence Thomas's law clerk in the Supreme Court. Eastman is 63. He's a fantastic scholar. He's a former chairman of the Federalist Society. That's an ultra right wing extremist group of lawyers who handpicked all three of Donald Trump's Supreme Court picks. He has been indicted on nine counts down in Georgia for racketeering, solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer, and filing false documents. Eastman is charged with not just writing legal memos that served as the roadmap for the false elector scheme, He is also charged with helping to organize the false electors. Eastman was also reportedly instrumental in trying to convince Vice President Mike Pence that he had the legal authority not to certify the presidential election on January 6. Eastman also works over at the Claremont Institute in California as director of its Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. 
The Claremont Institute is a right-wing think tank, which the New Republic described this month as, quote, an indispensable part of right-wing America's evolution towards authoritarianism. Well, John Eastman spoke on the uh, ellipse on January 6th. He, along with Rudy Giuliani, opened for uh, Donald Trump and tried to convince uh, an armed crowd of Trump supporters that as Trump's attorney, I, John Eastman, have proof that the presidential election had been stolen. Now, you might recall January 6th came on the heels of the Republicans losing the Senate in a runoff election in Georgia on January 5th, 2021. On January 5th, 2021, one day before the January 6th insurrection, in a Georgia runoff, John Ossoff, Democrat, won his Senate runoff election in Georgia, beating the incumbent Republican David Perdue. Also on January 5th, 2021, Raphael Warnock, Democrat, defeated the incumbent Republican Kelly Loeffler. That was January 5th. So on January 6th, it had become apparent that the Democrats were going to control the White House with Joe Biden, the Senate now with Chuck Schumer, and the House of Representatives with Nancy Pelosi. So here is John Eastman, Clarence Thomas's old law, cur- law clerk, lying, lying just like his old boss, Clarence Thomas, taught him to. Here he is insisting that not only did the Democrats steal the presidential election, but they also stole the election the night before in Georgia. Here is John Eastman at the Stop the Steal rally, minutes before that armed group of imbeciles he was speaking to stormed the Capitol. Here is John Eastman telling this mob of broken down human jalopies that he had incontrovertible evidence that the Senate had just been stolen by the Democrats and the White House was also stolen by the Democrats. And he had incontrovertible evidence to prove that. And I, again, I might add, in that audience of misbegotten deplorables was Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, fitting right in with them. She helped organize that Stop the Steal rally and had been texting Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and John Eastman, telling both to keep fighting because this election is a battle between good and evil. Ginny Thomas, by the way, failed her bar exam and can't practice law. Did I ever mention that before? Kind of like the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, who, like Ginny Thomas, failed his bar exam, so he is unable to practice law because he, Jim Jordan, failed his bar exam. Jordan. Jim Jordan. Bar exam. Failed. Have I ever mentioned that before? Anyway, here is attorney John Eastman inciting an insurrection, telling a mob of gingivitis and tank tops that the election in Georgia was stolen the night before and the presidential election had also been stolen. This after he and Rudy Giuliani had lost 61, 61 court challenges, unable to prove, unable to prove a single shred of election fraud. Keep this in mind as you hear John Eastman. Rudy and Eastman had gone before 61 judges. This was before January 6th. They went before 61 judges 61 times. They were unable to prove election fraud in all 61 hearings. They had traveled to battleground states trying to convince Republican state legislators and Republican governors like Brian Kemp to convene special sessions of their legislature to prove election fraud. And they were turned down by all seven, 
All seven Republican-controlled state legislatures said no. There's no evidence of election fraud. Here is John Eastman, whose disbarment proceedings are going on right now in California for the role he played on January 6th. Here is John Eastman helping incite an erection. An erection. I don't think that's possible for him. Ah, that was a boner. I apologize. Here is John Eastman helping to incite an insurrection because I doubt he's capable of getting an erection because here he is lying because like his good friend Ginny Thomas who definitely can't incite here is Ginny Thomas definitely can't incite an erection uh, uh, but uh, the, the two of them are inciting an insurrection because they believe this is a war between good and evil, so lie. Lie. It's okay to lie. That's what Clarence Thomas taught us during his nomination hearings. It's okay to lie if you're on the side of God. Clarence, Clarence taught us how to lie. Here's John Eastman, Clarence Thomas's former law clerk, in, inciting an insurrection. Look, We've got petitions pending before the Supreme Court that identify in chapter and verse the number of times state election officials ignored or violated their state law in order to put Vice President Biden over the finish line. We know there was fraud, traditional fraud that occurred. We know that dead people voted. But we now know because we caught it live last time in real time how the machines contributed to that fraud. And let me, as simply as I can, explain it. You know the old way was to have a bunch of ballots sitting in a box under the floor, and when you needed more, you pulled them out in the dark of night. They put those ballots in a secret folder in the machines, sitting there waiting until they know how many they need. And then the machine, after the close of polls, we now know who's voted, and we know who hasn't. And I can now, in that machine, match those unvoted ballots with an unvoted voter and put them together in the machine. And how do we know that happened last night in real time? You saw when it got to 99% of the vote total, and then it stopped. The percentage stopped, but the votes didn't stop. What happened, and you don't see this on Fox or any other stations, but the data shows that the denominator, how many ballots remain to be counted, how else do you figure out the percentage that you have? How many remain to be counted? That number started moving up. That means they were unloading the ballots from that secret folder, matching them, matching them to the unvoted voter, and voila, we have enough votes to barely get over the finish line. We saw it happen in real time last night, and it happened on November 3rd as well. And all we are demanding of Vice President Pence is this afternoon at 1 o'clock, he let the legislatures of the state look into this so we get to the bottom of it and the American people know whether we have control of the direction of our government or not. We no longer live in a self-governing republic if we can't get the answer to this question. This is bigger than President Trump. It is the very essence of our Republican form of government, and it has to be done. And anybody that is not willing to stand up to do it does not deserve to be in the office. It is that simple. There, there's Rudy thinking he's like Ed McMahon hosting Star Search. Uh, you know, I have a confession to make. I watched that, and uh, he incited an erection. Uh, he did. Well, where do I begin? Pure evil. Pure evil. This is the Claremont Institute. John Eastman is one of the directors of the Claremont Institute. These authoritarian uh, religious bigots, the Federalist Society. Here he is. 
there he is on the ellipse inciting an insurrection with lies, not a single shred of evidence that there was election fraud. But because he was Clarence Thomas's law clerk, he learned the truth doesn't matter. If it sounds convincing, say it. Say it. It's, if you tell people what they want to hear, then you're not lying. Here is John Eastman's mugshot. It was taken last week down in Fulton County, Georgia. And as he was leaving the jail, he was asked if he still thought the election was stolen. Now, keep, keep in mind, there is not a single shred of evidence to prove election fraud. In the, in the runoff on January 5th, 2021 in Georgia, or on November 3rd in the presidential election, 2020, not a single shred of evidence. Donald Trump's security chief for Homeland Security, who was overseeing the, uh, the security for the elections, a guy named Krebs, said this is the most secure presidential election in American history. There is not one government official who says there was election fraud. There is not one state election official in Georgia who said there was election fraud in Georgia. Brian Kemp, the Republican governor of Georgia, said we did three audits before January 6th. We did three audits of Georgia, no election fraud. Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state of Georgia, who's in charge of the elections, said, I'm a Republican. I voted for Trump. Three hand counts, three audits, no evidence, not a single shred of evidence of voter fraud. In all those battleground states that John Eastman and Rudy traveled to, they were trying to get you know, Rusty Bowers, the Republican Speaker of the Arizona State House. They said, you know, uh, convene a special session and prove there's election fraud before January 6th. Rusty Bowers said, no voter fraud. There was no, nobody could prove Michigan, no, Pennsylvania. These are Republican, Republican controlled state legislatures. They all said no voter fraud. Nobody. There's not one single elected official Republican in these battleground states who has said there, there's, there might have been some irregularities. Not one. Not one. Not one. But here is John Eastman, Clarence Thomas's former law clerk, Ginny Thomas's best friend. Here he is walking out of the Fulton County Jail after getting his mug shot, being asked, after all this, do you still believe there is evidence of voter fraud? Do you still think the election was stolen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Still. No question. No Sir. question in my mind. Absolutely. No question in my mind. Well, he has to say that because part he's been indicted for many crimes, but one of the crimes uh, he's been indicted for is lying about election fraud. So if he can prove to a jury that he honestly believed there was election fraud, then that says he did not have criminal intent. He's he's saying my state of mind is I believed there was election fraud. But in order for you to believe that, you need one shred of evidence, one folder, one person who stepped forward and said there was election fraud. None exists. Funny thing about political discourse. John Eastman can lie. Rudy can lie. Trump can lie when they go on TV, John Eastman can lie to a crowd of armed Trump supporters on January 6 and help incite an insurrection. But you can't lie in a courtroom. And there are consequences to trials. For example, Fox News 
had a very nasty trial. They had to settle with Dominion voting machines for three quarters of a billion dollars this year because they allowed Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell to come on their network and spread lies about voting machines. And they've got Smartmatic suing them right now. Watch what happened when the liar, John Eastman, appeared on Fox News last night with Laura Ingram. If you remember, Fox News had to pay Dominion three quarters of a billion dollars, okay? So watch what a chilling effect that three quarter of a billion dollar settlement, watch how it chills Laura Ingram uh, when she's talking to John Eastman. She wouldn't talk this way to John Eastman before the Dominion settlement, but now watch what happens when John Eastman comes on Fox News to lie. Oh, you know, one of the other things they said, well, Bill Barr said there wasn't any evidence of fraud. Well, I had lots of evidence of fraud. I haven't seen that evidence, and I'm always wanting to see everything, so I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen that evidence. So don't sue me or Fox News, because this is not 2020, and I, I haven't seen that evidence. Moving on. Uh, you haven't seen that evidence because there is none. And like I said, John Eastman, Clarence Thomas's for, former law clerk, is going to have to show proof of election fraud, which he can't because he's made it all up. Then Laura Ingram turned to Eastman's legal memos that insisted Mike Pence's role on January 6 was not ceremonial. John Eastman wrote a series of memos saying that, no, 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 the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act aren't specific enough, and uh, the, the vice president of the United States is not a ceremonial role. He's the president of the Senate, and he can refuse to certify the election of Joe Biden. Just because no vice president has ever done that before doesn't mean Mike Pence can't make history and be a hero. So here's Laura Ingram asking him about that. So again, so to be clarify this, on January 6th, what did you want to happen? And how was that historically grounded? Well, uh, before he answers, let me tell you what he wanted to happen. He wanted to delay the certification on January 6th. He wanted chaos. He wanted the Green Bay sweep. Peter Navarro and Steve Bannon came up with the Green Bay sweep. You flood the zone on January 6th with Republicans in the Senate and the House conspiring to hold up the certification for days by challenging each state's slate of electors so that enough doubt would be sown about election fraud that the Supreme Court would throw the presidential election back to Congress and Congress would pick the president, in which case, because of the way the votes from each state are weighted, Donald Trump would be reelected. And it would have appeared legitimate. You know, Congress settled it. You know, Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court settled it. It's legit. No, it's not legitimate. It's a stolen election. The whole idea was to create confusion, create doubt, create doubt. That's all you need to steal an election. They learned that in Bush v. Gore in 2000, and they try to do it again in uh, 20, 2020. Here is uh, Laura Ingram asking more questions. So just so the viewers can understand what would have unfolded and how that would have ultimately been constitutional. <laughs> I like the way, how would that have ultimately been, let me roll my eyes so they fall out of my head, unconstitutional. Look at Laura Ingram rolling her eyes when she says unconstitutional. Constitutional. <laughs> or constitutional. All right, constitutional. Here's Eastman's lie, okay? Here is what he claims he told Mike Pence, even though Mike Pence, Mike Pence's chief of staff and Mike Pence's lawyer were 
at the meeting with John Eastman, and they told the January 6th committee uh, that Eastman told Pence, had written memos telling Pence before the insurrection and after the insurrection, after the insurrection, uh, Eastman uh, w- was writing memos saying that Mike Pence was well within his constitutional rights not to certify the election. I've seen the memos. Even after the insurrection, when they went back into the chamber to finally certify, Eastman was still sending emails to Mike Pence and his chief of staff telling them, insisting that Pence should break quote, a minor piece of the Electoral Count Act and not certify. In this memo, he says, you know, it's a minor illegality, but you should go ahead and violate a tiny part of the Electoral Count Act and not certify. There is an email. It's in the discovery. It's in the January 6th evidence, the January 6th committee evidence, in which Eastman, John Eastman, says, after the attack, right, after people were trampled and shot to death, after the attack, Eastman writes an email suggesting that Pence break a tiny, teeny weeny part of the Electoral Count Act and not certify. A lawyer, John Eastman, a lawyer, former chairman of the Federalist Society, recommending that Pence break a little tiny law off of the Electoral Count Act, which means... Eastman knew Pence's role was purely ceremonial, but he went ahead and said, do it anyway. He, went, he knew it was purely ceremonial, but he went ahead and drafted legal memos in the lead up to January 6th, insisting Mike Pence should disobey his oath and not certify the election. Watch John Eastman lie. So, there, you know, uh, several things. Some people had urged that Vice President Pence simply had power to reject con- uh, electors uh, whose certification was still pending in yeah, legal contest. I don't believe contests. that, but go ahead. I don't believe I, that. I, I, I don't <laughs> That's either. one thing and I don't I, agree with. And I, and I explicitly told Vice President Pence in the Oval Office on January 4th that even though it was an open issue under the circumstances we had, I thought it was the weaker argument. You have in, in writing... You did not say it was the weaker argument. You said it's illegal, but you should do it anyway. Well, that is... uh... What I recommended, and I've said this repeatedly, is that he accede to requests from more than 100 state legislators in the swing states to give them a week to try and sort out the impact of what everybody acknowledged was illegality in the conduct of the election. election. I and I specifically said... It. Yeah, not everyone acknowledged well, it, but that was the argument that was being made, obviously. So the recommendation you made was ask for a... Uh, a 10-day, a 12-day break. That's also not allowed by the 12th Amendment, the Electoral Count Act, or the Constitution. The recommendation you made is illegal. Uh, the, The vice president can't say, you know, there's evidence of voter fraud, which there wasn't, and let's just stop uh, for a couple of days, for a week or two, and figure this out. That is malfeasance and against the law for a lawyer to recommend that to the vice president of the United States. Well, Colton Moore is a Georgia state senator, and Donald Trump loves this guy. You know why? Because Colton Moore loves Donald Trump. Colton should have been aborted back in 1993, which makes him 30 years old. He was elected to the Georgia state House when he was 24 because his mother didn't abort him back in 1993 when she had a chance. Colton Moore is a diehard Trump supporter, and I'm not making this up. He was an international auctioneer finalist back in 2017. That would be roughly 24 years after his mother should have aborted him but missed the opportunity. So he's an auctioneering champion. But instead of auctioning things off, he has become the auctionee. What do you bid for this parasitic lungworm? 
Here he is on The War Room with Steve Bannon sucking up to Donald Trump. Here he is sucking up to Donald Trump. How many people in my district questioned that election? No, none. None. Nobody questioned the 2020 election until your guy lost and you and he screamed election fraud. I mean, and now that we've got 19 people who are facing the rest of their life in prison because they spoke out against an election? They didn't speak out against an election. Well, they did speak out against an election. You're right. They were against the election. Uh, but that you misspoke. They, uh, they spoke out against the election results. That's not what they did. That's not their crime. Their crime is they forged documents. They broke into voting machines. They threatened the lives of election workers and presented false evidence of election fraud to government officials, which is against the law. Please continue. I mean, you know, I, I told one senator, I said, listen, I said, we've got to put our heads together and figure this out. We need to be taking action right now. Figure this out? You can't even figure out the People magazine word search, you brain dead cretin. No, you don't have to act. That's not your responsibility. You're a state senator and your secretary of state, a Republican. He did three recounts, three recounts and found no evidence of election fraud. Three recounts, you opportunistic weasel. You need to shut up, Colton Moore, and try to win elections by making the best argument to your voters, not claiming fraud just because you're a loser, you were born a loser, and should have been aborted a loser. Because if we don't, our constituencies are going to be fighting it in the streets. Yeah, blame it on the constituents, the people you represent. You're the one riling up the people by spreading lies. And then you say, I'm only responding to the lies my constituents believe, the lies that I told them. I, I, I'm just, I fired up my constituents and now my hands are tied. I must do what I told them to tell me to do. Do you want a civil war? I don't want a civil war. I don't want to have to draw my rifle. Do you want a civil war? I don't want a civil war. Who said anything about a civil war? I, rifles? Who said anything about having rifles? I don't want to draw my... You, th you think I want a civil war? Don't... Who said anything about guns and, and civil... Don't I seem like a totally together heterosexual man who doesn't believe sex is transactional? Who said anything about a civil war? I don't want to draw my rifle. I don't, I, I'm in a deeply committed, loving relationship. Who said anything about a civil war? I'm not consumed by self-loathing and drowning in a bottomless pit of shame for all those nights I woke up soaking wet because of that recurring dream of Hugh Jackman and I putting hot dogs into donuts. Who said anything about a civil war? I don't want to draw my rifle. I want to make this problem go away. Yeah. And by problem he wants to make go away, he means democracy. And the first step to getting that done is defunding Fonnie Willis of any Georgia tax dollars. Yeah, that will make the problem go away. Get rid of the district attorney and you draw your rifle and become a warlord. I like that plan, you deranged and demented brain dead sewer rat. Because she is not upholding her oath to the Constitution. She's not upholding her oath to the Constitution. Which Constitution are you talking about? The old Confederacies? Have you even read the Constitution? You see, Colton Moore, State Senator Colton Moore, learned a lesson. And that is, in Georgia, if you want to make it in the current Republican Party, you must be angry and stupid. That's all. And you know who taught him that? Georgia's angry and stupid congresswoman representing her state's 14th congressional district of angry and stupid white Southerners. Here is Marjorie Taylor Greene, 
taking a break from working out in the gym to go on social media and criticize our president's foreign policy. Joe Biden, you're not a president. You're a piece of shit. Okay. That's where people like Colton Moore learn from their elders on how to have a career as a Republican politician in Georgia. Well, Brian Kemp is the Republican governor of Georgia. Not, uh, not a fan of his. He stole the, the race from Stacey Abrams. We've talked about that. But uh, Trump called him repeatedly before January 6th and urged him to convene a special session of the state legislature to prove election fraud. And to his credit, Brian Kemp said, there's no election fraud, Mr. President. I voted for you. We did three recounts. There's not a shred of evidence. I wish you won. I wish I could help you, but you lost. He is right now resisting the push to fire Fawny Willis, to have her impeached. And uh, he's resisting this. Uh, from what I understand, that if the virus spreads to Georgia, and it doesn't seem to be, there are enough Republicans in the state legislature to impeach Fawny Willis if Brian Kemp uh, got, behind, uh, got behind that. Here he is at a press conference talking about the calls to uh, remove Fawny Willis. This is Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia on Thursday. It was Thursday? Yes, it was Thursday morning. Well, let me be clear. We have a law in the state of Georgia that clearly outlines the legal steps that can be taken if constituents believe their local prosecutors are violating their oath by engaging in unethical or illegal behavior. Up to this point, I have not seen any evidence that D.A. Willis's actions or lack thereof warrant action by the Prosecuting Attorney Oversight Commission. But that will ultimately be a decision that the commission will make. That is uh, Governor Brian Kemp. He continues. A special session of the General Assembly to end run around this law is not feasible and may ultimately prove to be unconstitutional. Well, Donald Trump has met a force that is to be reckoned with down in Georgia. Brian Kemp is being trashed by Donald Trump incessantly. He's made an enemy out of the governor of Georgia. And Brian Kemp is the most popular politician in Georgia. According to the Atlanta Constitution, Brian Kemp has an 80% approval rating, a 15% disapproval rating among Georgia Republicans. And yes, Donald Trump has a 42-point lead over his closest Republican leader, in Republican rival in the uh, Georgia primary so far. But... Uh, it's going to be, uh, I don't think Donald Trump is going to beat Brian Kemp in Georgia. Well, Clarence Thomas taught an entire generation of conservatives how to lie. And so we now have, with some exceptions, uh, I'm going to say Brian Kemp and Secretary of State uh, Rassensperger, or however you pronounce his name. They're an exception to the rule. But Clarence Thomas taught an entire generation of conservatives how to lie. And so we now have an entire political party of bullshit artists. Bullshit has become the high art of political rhetoric. And I'm going to play this clip of a man in Nebraska. Nebraska is a deeply red state. This is a man who got pulled over by state troopers because... Uh, riding shotgun was his pet bull. And I keep looking at this video. The man had a pet bull and uh, riding shotgun. And I thought, wow, red states like Nebraska really have grown used to bullshit. Take a look at this video. That's his pet bull.
That is uh, Red State, Nebraska, where they have really gotten used to bullshit. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you all for watching. Please like this video. That's the best way. To, I got to get out of that. Sorry about that. Please, please like the video. Uh, that's the best way to keep me in your feed. And uh, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you to the moderators in our chat room. Thank you for your comments. Uh, they, you're, you're sending me information and links, and it's, it's fantastic. It just informs the, the topics on this show. So thank you all for the information that you're giving me. I appreciate the comments. Please subscribe to my newsletter. It'll be coming out after Labor Day. I'm thinking of taking Monday off. I don't know. I should probably take Monday off in honor of the labor movement. So I'm thinking about that. I'm going to feel guilty if I work on Labor Day, and I'm going to feel guilty if I don't work on Labor Day. So I have to figure that one out. I think that covers everything. And we're going to do office hours sometime again in September so I can meet all my listeners. This is an audio podcast, so please subscribe to it wherever mediocre podcasts are heard. Thank you all. I'll see you tomorrow at 12.05 a.m. Eastern, unless I'm a little burnt out, and then we'll start at 12.30 a.m. Eastern. My, my goal is to do it at 12.05 Eastern. Thank you all very much.